I've been focused on finding rhythms and things which can help me enjoy a more regulated, calm, content life as a neurodivergent person. So let's talk about that. It's been quite a challenging period over the last couple of years. Whilst my workload has increased, which is brilliant, and I'm so thankful for the opportunities that I've gotten, at the same time in my personal life, I've been facing some really big issues, things that I've been doing that haven't been healthy and things I've been ignoring that needed to be addressed. And so I'm addressing them and it's not easy. And sometimes I think that hiding from all those things and just powering through was better but I know that that's not really true and I know that it's going to be worth the work and I'm hopeful that I'm going to find a rhythm of life that brings me I guess a kind of euphoria but also is accepting that life is real and stuff happens and you've got to feel the feels. I want to start by talking about the process of doing therapy. As I've talked about before if you've been here before I am in therapy at the moment I'm in therapy with a specialist in working with neurodivergent people and we've been addressing some of the trauma that I've been living with without being aware of living with that and I think that many neurodivergent people live with trauma that they just kind of accepted as normal, that they just kind of thought was everyone's experience and maybe aren't aware of the responses and the, like the trauma responses that are happening because of carrying this trauma. So it's kind of like carrying a really heavy rucksack that you didn't realize you were carrying because that was your normal. I'll actually link to my video that I already made about trauma and neurodivergence in the description box if you want to hear more about that specifically. But um, for me, as well as the trauma that I've been carrying just from being the weird, unaccepted person in the world, I've also been carrying trauma from some very personal, very difficult experiences I had as a child and a teen and actually into adulthood too that I'm not going to get into here because they involve other people whose permission I don't have to share that story but maybe one day. So for now I'm just going to talk about the process of trauma and how that's been for me. Trauma therapy that is. So basically it's been hard. It's been really hard. I'd say I've been working with my therapist now since I'm going to say the end of August, but that is a guess. And initially we did quite a lot of sessions that were just really about me learning to trust my therapist. So just exploring the really small issues in preparation for being able to address the big ones. And then after Christmas, I felt ready to start addressing that big stuff, you know? And it's been really hard. I kind of feel like I've been working, living and processing and I haven't really had a lot of space for anything else. I've been looking at child Ella and how she feels and what she's carrying and what she wants and how that impacts adult Ella and what adult Ella needs to do to take care of child Ella and to take care of adult Ella in a more holistic way moving forward. It's hard, it's caused a lot more meltdowns, it's caused a lot more emotions. And then the next thing that happened was I have actually managed to successfully stop numbing my emotions. So recognising that I was numbing my emotions using a variety of different numbing tools for like a really, really long time and recognising that to some extent I was numbing those emotions for everyone else's comfort. And that me feeling like I need to numb my emotions for everyone else's comfort was a part of what was driving that, which then again relates back to my past trauma. It's very cyclical, you know? So I've been feeling the emotions, which honestly, honestly feels like a full-time job. I've been feeling those emotions and learning to process them and learning to soothe myself. And in learning to soothe myself, I found things that are comforting and warm and make me feel safe. Wholesome things, things that are healthy for me. So 
I thought, let's share some of those things. Let's talk about the wholesome things that we can do to enhance our lives as neurodivergent people. One of those things is developing a kind of a journaling practice, I suppose, but I've been using a specific journal. Um, I've been using the Daily Stoic Journal, and I've also been using the accompanying book, The Daily Stoic 366 Meditations on Wisdom, Perseverance and the Art of Living. I actually started doing these because Mr. Purple started doing the Stoic book a full year ago and I can see how much it's benefited him and although initially I was kind of sceptical because I don't really buy into any kind of self-help which tells us that the reasons we're not okay is because we're not trying hard enough or that we can fix something with an easy fix like oh well if you just don't think like this anymore you'll be okay and and I'm not gonna lie sometimes when I'm doing the prompts initially my reaction is this is assuming that I can control my thoughts which I can't so this is nonsense but actually oftentimes when I have those thoughts that frustration and I go through that I come out of the other side of it kind of understanding the prompt more and understanding that it's more nuanced than that the kind of principle behind Stoicism, I'm not really going to get into a huge amount because I don't really fully understand it, but essentially what I've learned so far is that it's about prioritising what is important to you and what you can impact and kind of letting the rest go. It's about being aware of your thoughts, being aware of your actions, being aware of your mind and how you use your mind and what is important in this life. And And I'm kind of happy with all that. that, that really helps. So just to have a look at it a little bit more closely, looking at the prompts, so today, let's look at today's prompt. Today's prompt was, do I appreciate this mind which I have been given? Um, and I was like, no, I don't. I basically spend all my time thinking, you shouldn't have thought that, you shouldn't have said that, you shouldn't have done that, and very little time thinking, wow, what a beautiful mind, look at all the things that it's done, you know? So it contains prompts like that. Let's look at another prompt just to get you a kind of full view. Where have I traded away freedom and how can I get it back? This was March the 11th. And this is about how you trade your freedom to your workplace, to your friends, to your commitments in a way by feeling like you have to do X, Y and Z rather than feeling that you are following the path that you want to follow sometimes, right? And sometimes that's necessary, you know, we all have bills to pay. But sometimes it's good to reflect on the fact that you don't have to trade away your freedom. Yeah, I'm probably not explaining it very well, um, but I really didn't want to script this, I just wanted to sit and have a chat with you. So I, I've been doing this since the start of January, so uh, I guess two and a half months now, and there's definitely been a lot of value in doing this. I don't necessarily even think it has to be this book or that book. I think that just the practice of sitting down with yourself and giving yourself time to think about how you are living your life or approaching your life or using your mind to assess whether that's what you want to be doing and whether you have any choices or whether you can reframe that is a useful thing to do and I've definitely found this a useful part of the rhythm of life that I'm building to enable me to feel better regulated and more content. Another thing that I've been just completely obsessed with lately is tea. So I've struggled with addiction which I've talked about on the channel and I don't want to get into that because actually now that I'm not engaged with my addiction I kind of want to move away from it being a part of my identity because I think that's part of the problem. So I'm not going to talk about it a huge amount only to say that tea has replaced that negative thing, that negative coping strategy which I'm not going to hate on because it was the only thing I had at the time as a coping strategy and it did work to some extent but now I've moved away into an obsession with tea. So it started out with just like, oh, maybe I'll start drinking a cup of green tea in the morning. I've read loads of stuff about green tea. It's supposed to be really good for you. If I punctuate my mornings with this time to make this cup of tea for myself, I'll feel nurtured, that'll be a good thing. Only because I'm autistic and because I have ADHD, this turned into, let me research herbal tea for hours every day and 
buy lots and lots of tea and become completely obsessed with it. Which kind of amuses me but also I, I just love. I love how much time I've spent thinking about tea in the last five weeks. So I now have an entirely dedicated tea cupboard and I don't just mean the regular tea cupboard where you've got your tea bags and your coffee and your cups. I mean I have a large cupboard and I have about at this time about 15 different kinds of herbal tea. Some of them contain rubush, some of them contain green tea, some of them are just fruity and I have a little teapot and I have some really divine mugs and just taking that time to prepare tea for myself in kind of the most complicated way I guess using loose leaf tea is just it just feels like self-care, it feels like self-love and it really does make me feel good. And I've gotten into a little bit of a rhythm where I have certain teas at certain times. So in the evening I'll often have either a chamomile tea or a turmeric and cocoa nib tea because they feel really relaxing. In the afternoon I might have a, a cold brew herbal tea because I've also gone into cold brewing which is where you steep the leaves in cold water for about five or six hours before drinking it so it makes kind of quite a nice iced tea kind of experience and in the morning I've been drinking matcha tea. So I started out by drinking green tea in the mornings and then I was recently buying tea from the shop where I buy tea and I noticed that they got matcha tea and in the past I've tried matcha tea and been like "Ooh, this tastes like dirt because I can't really drink something just because it's good for you. But the person in the shop was like, let me make you some, maybe you just didn't have it made right. And oh my goodness, were they right. Matcha tea, prepared correctly, is absolutely delicious. So the shop where I buy my tea, um, Burden Blend, not sponsored, just that's where I get my matcha, um, have a bunch of different kinds of matcha teas. They've got like a... Um, blueberry, salted caramel, ice cream, like just loads of different kinds of matcha. And I've been drinking mermaid matcha, which is matcha and blue pea flower. And I make it into an iced drink with a little bit of vanilla syrup, oat milk, water. And the thing with matcha that's really joyous is the ritual involved in making it. I have a little bamboo whisk you know, you've, you've hopefully seen at the start of this video the process of me making matcha and so it's very kind of involved, it's very ceremonial, it feels like you're doing something really special for yourself. And on top of that, there's actually been some scientific studies about the impact of matcha on anxiety. So they did this maze test with mice where they put mice in a maze which has kind of arms, which has kind of bits where the mice, when they're feeling anxious while doing the maze, can kind of hide and they can use these little anxiety spots, these little cosy spaces when they're feeling anxious. And they found that the mice that had had matcha extract, I should say, not matcha tea, but matcha extract, used the anxiety safe spaces a lot less than the mice who had not had matcha extract. And they think that this is because matcha has an impact on dopamine D1 and serotonin receptors, which are connected to anxiety. So it's by no means conclusive, but in my own personal research, I've been drinking matcha every day for about two weeks now. And honestly, I feel like it really is impacting the levels of anxiety that I'm experiencing and making me feel better. So tea, tea. And if you'd like to hear more about tea, I talk about tea a lot at the moment on my Instagram channel at Purple Ella and Coco because that's where I tend to do obsessive talk because you've got the stories facility so I can just be like hey let me tell you more about tea. So if that's something that you're here for maybe go follow me over there. Another thing that I find incredibly useful for my um, well-being I guess is art, creativity of any kind really. So I do quite a lot of digital drawing using, I use Procreate and an Apple Pencil and an iPad and I spend quite a lot of time just sitting on the sofa under my weighted blanket, maybe I've got some music on with my headphones, just like totally getting into that creative process. I also do use um, pens, paints, I paint stones, I make things out of Fimo, just whatever I feel like doing really so sometimes I feel like if I'm using my Procreate I'm probably getting into a bit more trying different new ideas because you have that freedom to 
erase and go back and add layers and if I just want to like express an emotion via art I'll get out my uh, Copic pens and some good paper and I'll just kind of have at it um, if I want something a bit more mindful I might do stone painting you know so like there's like different creative stuff that works for different states of mind the good thing about the Procreate Apple Pencil setup is that a lot of the time I'm quite tired and I can just do that sitting on the sofa without even needing to sit upright and I feel like adding a creative practice into my day nearly every day is really benefiting me because quite often I'll do it at that point in the day where I've finished my working day so you know four or five o'clock but I'm not yet into my evening routine and I need something to kind of help me transition and I think that is one of the things that I would say about a lot of the things I'm doing here is that they're helping with those transitions because transitions can be really hard for us particularly for us neurodivergent people and so I can transition from my morning routine into my morning work day by making a matcha tea that punctuates and marks the point at which I transition from one into the other and I can transition from my lunch time into my afternoon working with a different kind of tea and then I can punctuate my afternoon into my evening with a little bit of creative time. And so I think it's about creating these rhythms and these flows that get me through the days because I don't do well with a rigid routine. First of all, if something comes up and it has to change, I'm gonna be really thrown by that. And secondly, because of my ADHD, I just get bored. Whereas rhythms, so mini routines, I guess, like in the mornings, I always do some yoga. I always have tea at this time. I generally do art at this time, but it could be if I'm out and about, if I need to go out, but I want to be creative, I could go out and do some photography, take some photographs. It's like rhythms that have got flexibility built into them. So if I'm not at home, but I need to transition from my morning routine into whatever's happening, I can usually go to a cafe and pick up a match a drink. So I can still keep that as part of my rhythm. And I think that rhythm is a really kind of important way for me to look at life. It helps me, it helps me flow. Oh my gosh, I feel like I'm sounding like a proper hippie right now. But whatever. <laughs> it helps me flow through the day with less resistance and less anxiety. And then when I get to the end of the day, and I really want to relax, and maybe I'm overloaded. Sometimes I'm overloaded at the end of the day and I'm feeling um, I'm just going to stim a bit. I'm rocking. I'm aware that I'm rocking. I'm just I'm really trying to embrace the stim and this is what I feel like doing. Uh, I'm quite often overstimulated at that point and I've got that like bees in my head, um, anxiety, buzzy, adrenaline state feeling going on. I found that something that really, really helps with that is a sensory bath. So I might light some candles. I'm going to run a bath. I really, really love bath bombs. I particularly love lush bath bombs. I'll have that bath bomb. I'll have the light ting, you know, a little bit mellow. I might put on some white noise. I quite like the sound of rain or, you know, something like that in the background. And I'll lie back and I'll just kind of really try and embrace my body and not my mind, by which I mean, I try and draw my attention away from the buzz and into the, how my body feels and exploring, you know, being in the warm water and, and that sensory experience that can really help me, yeah, transition into a more kind of evening mellow routine, which really helps because I know that if I don't do something like that, I can often end up having panic attacks in the evenings as that kind of adrenaline state turns into, goes from being something good where I'm like, woo, I'm living, I'm doing it, I'm having it into, ah, not even explaining that with words. What is this video? What even is this video? And then, you know, finally, I just want to mention this because water, water, so easy to forget to drink water, so easy to not realize you're dehydrated and your head hurts and it you don't feel good because you don't have enough water in your body. And um, so I, ha I have a really nice water bottle, which I love. This is purple and it's a chilli bottle and it keeps my water at exactly the right temperature because I like my water to be cold or I can't drink it. Um, and I carry it with me all day. And so in between my tea drinking, I've got water and I can make sure that I'm straight, staying hydrated. So it's just the basics, isn't it really? It's about finding ways to have those basic needs met in a gentle and compassionate and self-caring way and not feeling bad about that and not feeling like 
not feeling like you're being precious, feeling like what you're doing is actually a good thing. So I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope that you're doing well and I hope that if you're not doing well you can take from this the opportunity to care for yourself because you deserve to be cared for and you are your best advocate and the person best placed to know how to care for you and when to care for you and to do that caring. You don't need someone else to care for you, you can care for yourself. Which is something that I'm saying I suppose because in the past I didn't feel confident that I could. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button, subscribe, join my club, and I'll be back next week. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.